doing the the seminar and finally this moment has, is here with us so welcome again everybody congratulations with surviving three seasons and starting with course one if i'm not wrong and uh, we have janos janos riga to start this fourth session of our seminar for edition and uh, janos is here obviously and he is going to talk about taking a very fast algorithm and make it making it faster right yeah i think the title it. is on the screen please janos go <clears> ahead <throat> yeah so Uh, do I still have to give the talk, or is that already enough for everybody? To give? Oh, you. <laughs> I, I so. Okay, yeah. it's up to you. I, okay. I believe yeah. you, you like it, and I don't think you are able to stop here. Yeah, no, I, I can't stop. It's, it's, it's correct. So actually, this very fast algorithm is an algorithm you all know very well. You just maybe don't know that name. Um, this algorithm is in these circles usually called um, the um, cyclic projection method. And uh, it's called the Kachmash method because it was originally introduced in Kachmash for linear systems. So usually when people work on linear systems with this method, then it's usually still called the Kachmash method. I don't know whether this is the correct pronunciation. I made that up. Um, and... Uh, But everybody, uh, no, nobody has uh, has complained so far. So uh, as long as nobody complains, I call it like that. And <clears throat> so, and then I'm also interested in something that also other people have done. Um, and for example, Matthew Tam has worked on this Gerhard Cauchy acceleration for this Kachmash method, for this um, cyclical projection method. And uh, I want to take that a bit further. And, uh, but before I do that, maybe I revisit a little bit Uh, uh, why we actually do this, why we want to do this, um, what has been done, I mean, what this Gosh, uh, Gerhard Cauchy acceleration really is, because when you read these papers, then basically you see operators all over the place and you have no idea what's going on. Um, <clears throat> but if you really look into the, I mean, what it really is, then things, um, things become a lot more transparent and then you can go on and then um, yeah and then you can go further so let's have a look so uh, this works okay so um, the key application is that made this me method basically so successful in the first place and maybe now there are other applications as well but uh, in the first place it became a very um, prominent because of computerized tomography. So you have somebody and somebody is not well and you want to see what's going on inside. So if it's simple, you just shoot an X-ray picture. <clears throat> so you just see something. If it's more complicated, then you use com computerized tomography, which is basically many X-ray pictures. And then you try to use all this information in order to find out what is going on. So here we have a very simple object. And this object, of course, it's overly simplified. It has four pixels only. So that's also an assumption that our object uh, consists of pixels, which is by no means clear, right? Um, but that's what we usually want. We want a digital picture of the object. So we can, of course, we're making a mistake, but we can assume that we have four pixels there, which we are trying to image. And in every pixel, we have a color or a density of the, of the matter there. And so what happens when I, for example, have here this device and shoot an X-ray through the object, um, and then I have a screen here that basically records like how much of that x-ray actually arrives there and usually if you just make one picture well if there's a bone you see a white spot if there is nothing you see a black spot um, because there was a lot of uh, x-rays coming through and now let's see how this actually happens so the x-ray goes through here there's only air nothing happens then it hits the first pixel it traverses it for a little time And then it traverses up at the fourth pixel. Then it goes through the third pixel for a long time. And then the first pixel for a short time again. Hmm. So what's going to happen with that X-ray? Well, if you imagine this is a homogeneous 
let's let's say something like milk also right you, you can somehow have air coming through but not not very easily so what happens a certain percentage of what you have there gets absorbed all the way right and that means we have a differential equation and this differential equation is going to be have a solution something like e to the power of um, so the length i travel um, times well the density of of the matter so what arrives here is somehow uh, twisted through an exponential um, basically the the length of these pixels of, of the intersection of the ray with the pixel times the density and so that means that basically if you want to reconstruct these four pixel values from the um, eight measurements that we have taken here one up to eight then basically we get um, eight equations one for every ray and we have four states which are the um, densities of matter in these pixels or the colors of these pixels and here what we write in are basically into the matrix are the lengths of the intersections and because we have this exponential of something uh, we take the logarithm and um, of the of the measurement and then we get some other numbers so this is just a very simple example with four pixels and uh, made up values in here um, and then basically we have to solve a non-square linear system <coughs> well we could do that um, for this very simple system by hand for realistic systems we don't want to do that and um, so what is realistic would be a million pixel would that be unrealistic probably not right because a million is a thousand times a thousand and that's not the greatest of all real resolutions that you could have especially when it's about a medical decision or something so i mean a million states is not uncommon that would mean you have a million here for the dimension oops for the dimension n and uh, here maybe you have then two million or something of that kind so you have a huge matrix which you definitely don't want to store and you have a huge state and how do you even work on this if you don't um, want to store everything that you under normal circumstances would store well wouldn't it be nice if we could work with one row of this matrix after another it would be helpful right so we all we would need to do would be to say okay now i have this measurement maybe what what do i get out 0.62 i get 0.62 here at that end um and uh, or the the logarithm of that is 0.62 and now um i know where my uh, device was i mean all i need to record is an angle that's just a number or even the the number of the data set it's also enough and then you know what you recorded and <clears throat> so just from this information you can traverse here you can basically on the fly generate uh, this row and you can do something with this row and the question is what do we do with that row <clears throat> what we do is actually very simple um, let's say we have the row and we have this so maybe we project simply our current state onto the set of all x that get the first row right so this times that is that so this is a uh, an n minus one dimensional subspace and we we um, project to that and this is here now supposed to uh, show this uh, n minus one dimensional subspace so we start somewhere we project on this first subspace then we make up the next row um, use the measurement we have find <clears throat> the projection to h2 and so on until we are done we have traversed the matrix once and then we uh, repeat the process we go back here um, project and so on and so on um, <clears throat> sorry so i can't do much about this coughing because i have the teaching to do at the moment and that means that i cough more and more throughout the semester it uh, will be over soon so um do you have allergy to teaching? Uh, yeah, since 2020, I have a teaching allergy. Yeah. I see. Um, and uh, so the idea is, well, you have two different versions. You see that in the literature. 
And um, so what you can do is you can think of this as you are somewhere in X and you want to move along the direction of the normal of this hyperplane. You want to go directly onto this hyperplane. Can I, does this work here? That would be very useful for the rest of the talk. Yes. So you want to, you go that way and actually this here is the normal, right? So you're moving along the normal of the hyperplane up to this point. And then, um, so this would be then this representation here. Um, and basically this uh, numerator here makes sure that after you're done with projecting, well, you get it right. Hmm? So if you imagine you multiply everything with AJ transposed in the end, you're going to get this. Um, and this means that you get it right. Um, another view which looks, and this can be very confusing when you see that in other papers, uh, which looks totally different, but is exact, exactly the same thing is you have a projector and apply to X and then you correct by this um, constant term. And it's doing exactly the same thing. You can just do the computation. One is exactly the same as the other. It just looks very different and can then be confusing if you come across it in the other way. So um, why is this so popular? Well, we need one row at a time only. That's a very good reason for being popular. And uh, so the other reason is that initially it converges very fast. And this has been a mystery for a long time. And uh, very recently, Steinerberger has contributed something to um, find out why this occurs. And this is only um, obvious in the um, stochasticized version of this algorithm where you choose, um, where you choose your uh, subspace to project to at random. And actually what, what he found was, I mean, he doesn't write it that way, but if you, if you read this properly, then you understand that what actually is going on is um, that basically um, you can express the iteration in terms of the singular, of the right singular values or uh, vectors of the matrix that you are trying to solve there, Ax equals b. And um, the, at first, the um, fast singular values, they basically dec decay very fast. And then in the end, you're left with the slow ones. But the advantage of this method is it, it really in norm at, at the beginning, it's very fast because basically of the fast singular values. Um, of the large singular values that makes things disappear very quickly. <clears throat> and then you have these slow singular values um, that basically then really uh, make the method very slow. And uh, before that was not clear, it was basically a, a miracle. You always saw, usually you see an error, maybe I draw this, usually you see error plots that look like this, more or less. something like this and here you see something like this very steep at the beginning and then becoming actually pretty flat and this is an effect of the um well you can you can write it out in terms of the of the singular vectors and then you understand why that is okay so much about the method and um, well when matthew tam first introduced me to this method then i already thought, hmm, well, this method is doing a lot of stuff and computing a lot of stuff on the fly that could be useful. And so from that time on, basically, um, I always thought of, of this as a um, residual. So what do I call a residual? I call this vector here a residual. Um, and uh, so what is in this residual? So I have here a certain something and I divide this by the length of a1. So why do I do this? Because I compute this every time I process a row. So you see, I compute this number and I have to compute that number just to basically form the step. And so my logic was, why would I throw this away? Um, and actually there's an, another logic also for computing this. Yeah, it comes for free, so why wouldn't I use that? And especially here, when you have such a huge matrix, you don't want to use a, um, a residual, a proper residual, because it's it's very expensive to compute. Why would you do that? Um, so I thought, okay, let's uh, let's let's do that. And if you think about it, it is actually the length of the step. You see, if you 
Um, if you rearrange this a little bit, um, and we put a minus here, and we put an equal sign here, then you see here, this is the step. And on the right-hand side here, you have that vector. And what is the norm of that vector? Well, it is this number divided by the norm of aj, right? Because here you get um, a norm and this kills one of these exponents here. So that's what you've got. So this is the length of an individual step. So basically you get these step lengths for free and I just write them into this vector here because I've got them anyway. <clears throat> so maybe they will be useful. It's a strange residual. Why? Because usually you have completed your cycle or whatever. You have completed your cycle. And then at the end of your cycle, you look at your residual and then you decide to do something. But here it's very strange. So I take an individual step. So I take, for example, the P1, or not even the P1. Before taking the P1, I measure how wrong am I actually currently? How wrong am I now for the first row? I do the same here, right, in the first row here. But then things get different. So basically I'm saying, okay, after, I've, after I have done my first step in the cycle, how wrong am I now from the point of view of the second row? So it's not a normal residual. It is something very different. It is something that is, that's why I call that dynamic. It, I mean, it, it uh, measures along the sub-cycle, so to say, along in, it measures the fine structure somehow. And, um, and I get this measurement, this very unusual measurement, I get that for free. So that's really interesting. Let's have a look. And then I asked myself, basically, because I knew what Matthew had been doing and that he was working with this paper from Gerhard and Koshi. And then I was wondering like, okay, he is basically using, he's not writing it that way, but he's basically using the square norm of this R, of this residual R. So I began to ask like, what is that really? What is the square norm of the residual of R, of R? And maybe for the first expression here, then basically you see an equation and you don't understand it. But when you look here, what do we see here? So basically let's say we are here in X1 and our projection takes us here. And this length here is R2. Right, so this is this this um, second uh, component of this R. So the square of on, in R, I have this, and when I square it, of course, I get the square of this length. Then I have what here? I have the error that I had before before I was taking the step, and now I have here the error after taking the step. And what do I find here? Well, a right angle, right? So this is basically by Pythagoras. <clears throat> by Pythagoras, I know that the error after a step, the square error after a step, is the square error before the step minus the square of that thing. And this is the jth component of my vector, right? And I can play that game again and again and again and again. And because I can play that game all over again, and this is implicitly, of course, contained in these papers, um, I have this. The, um, <coughs> this uh, norm of the square norm of the residual is actually the difference between the square error before I did my cycle and the square error after I did my cycle. Okay, so this looks like something useful. I actually can see just from looking at the stuff I have computed, like how much I have gone down. That is very strange if you think about it, because usually you have points all over the place, a method is hopping around and basically you don't have any good information. You Usually you have information by looking at F, if you minimize F of X or something, you look at F and then this gives you some information. But here we don't look at F, we just use these funny numbers we have anyway and get a statement about the error reduction and not an, not an estimate or something, we get equality. That is very unusual, I think. And then there is another property and must be implicitly contained in these papers, but um, 
I have never seen it that clearly. So what is actually going on here? Here we had something going on with the exact solution or an exact solution of the system. But now what we do is we are basically looking um, at the step length here. And so here, oh, actually here's this is one bracket too much, sorry. Um, what is going on here? Let's, um, let's draw this here, this inner product. We have a vector X star here. And um, we have a vector X. X star is the point we are trying to find the solution and X is the point where we're currently at. So, and um, we are trying to find X star. But unfortunately, we get it wrong because we go to P of X. So, wouldn't it be interesting to have some information about how wrong we, we, we went or let's say about the angle here? Do we get at least the angle right? Hmm? That would be nice. But this here is more or less the angle between these two vectors. So between the direction in which I would like to go and the direction in which I'm really going. So this here tells me something about the angle and I can find out about this angle by looking at the square norm of R and by looking at the square norm of the step that I've taken. But of course I know what step I've taken and of course I know the square norm of R. And that means that basically I also have information about this uh, angle type thing here. Well, that's quite a lot. Plus this R really behaves like a residual. So either the residual, the normal residual, so it's equivalent, we, the normal residual is uh, zero, we have found a solution. And we have a fixed point of P. This is, of course, something that this community uses extensively. And this funny residual is zero. Um, it's not difficult to prove, but it's, it's really not worth going through. Um, yeah, just like, like these. Yeah, this year is basically this polarization uh, equation, and this year is Pythagoras, as we have as we have seen. And here you see even less because I'm just making use of a theoretical identity, um, and this more or less directly gives me this. <clears throat> okay, so we have this um, Gerhard Cauchy acceleration by Gerhard and Cauchy, um, and uh, now. Um, refined by Matthew Tam because they have only treated uh, basically homogeneous linear systems. And Matthew has generalized this to um, inhomogeneous linear systems. And uh, so they say, and rightly say, that if you take this funny step size, this, they write it differently. There's a, a big sum here at the top and a big sum at the bottom and so on. But uh, this is basically what they, what they write. So if you put the square norm of R on the top and the square norm of the step length at the bottom, <clears throat> then you find mysteriously the solution to this least squares problem. And this is really bizarre, right? So you have a point X And that's why I got so interested in that, because in a sense, this is really bizarre. If you, if you don't know already, then this is really strange. And why is this really strange? Because here's your X star. The, the, <clears throat> the, um, maybe your step goes in this direction. And now you would like to find along this line, you would find the, you would like to find, is there a way of doing this? Don't find any way of doing this. So let's do it in a different way. You would like to find the point on this line that is closest to X star. And this works because you just have to multiply here, basically your step length with that number and you're going to get to this point. And why is this bizarre? This is bizarre because I don't know what X star is, right? So usually, of course, we know how to solve a least squares problem. No problem. 
but solving a least squares problem when you don't even know the data, that is really a bit unusual, right? And why does that work? Um, it works for this reason. And uh, I know I'm basically spending a lot of time just drawing stuff, but I think it's really helpful to, for understanding uh, what goes on. And I would rather, um, rather skip other stuff than not um, making this clear. So these are supposed to be concentric circles. I know this is not working. So let's say here we have our X star. So the square norm of the error that basically I'm trying to minimize along a line here. So I'm putting a line through there. And now I'm painting the same picture. I have the, um, I have my X here. I have my, let's say P of X here. And what I want to find is the closest point here. But these are concentric circles. I'm going here uh, and putting the square norm there and I'm moving along a line. So what do I get? Well, I get a parabola. And I know like what the curvature is and so on because I know that these are just concentric circles. And, um, <clears throat> And, and uh, yeah, and this is really just the square. So uh, I know what it is. So let's say the parabola looks like this. Let's say here I'm at S equals zero, which corresponds to X. And I measure, so I measure the, I don't know the height, but what I know based on what I've shown you before, I know the reduction that's um, that's that's in here. This reduction here, this here, I know this term, and this term tells me how far do I get down by going to s equals one, which is p of x, right? So I know if I get that drawn properly, so I'm moving from there to there. Um, so now I have this here and so this is this height up. So this here is basically from there to there. This here is norm of R of X squared. That's what it is. This height here, this height, difference in height. So I have a difference in height and uh, I know how long this here is. So I basically I have this triangle and this is a nonlinear function. So how many possibilities are there that I go so far and have this difference in height? Well, two, right? Symmetric on this side and on that side. In both cases, I want to take the same length to the center. So um, basically just by finding that out, like how far did I go and how far did I go down? I know how far I must go. I must go to the middle, to the min of the parabola um, and then, I did it, right? So this is the entire mystery behind Gerhard Koshi. Um, and took me a while to, to find that out. But now that this is basically so clear, we can do a proof of that theorem. So this part of the theorem is definitely well known. So if I have a solution and I want to do my Kachmar step or cyclic projection step, and I want to get as, as far as, as close as possible to the solution, what should I do? I should use this particular step size. What I think is not known, I'm not sure about that, is this part of the theorem. I can actually tell because it's actually so simple. It's really just a parabola. I can tell, I mean, this here is the error I had previously. This here is the error I have after my accelerated step, and I can measure the gain, and the gain is this. I, I'm not sure whether <clears throat> that was known. So, and um, if you wanted to, you could compare this to the um, error reduction by Kachmash, which as we have said, is basically this square norm here. Okay, so the proof, and this is actually now basically almost the proof for two papers because, and this is why, why I spent so much time on this. 
the proof for more or less two papers. So of course, they have done some extensions of this and so on, but for the gist of two papers is now this one slide. Basically here, this is your quadratic, this is your parabola. It's called now G. And here you see your straight line and here you see the square norm. And uh, while well, you're trying to get close to this. Well, all we need to do is we arrange a little bit. So all the terms with S get grouped to one side, all the terms without S get grouped to the other side. So we take the square of that, we take the square of the terms that have an S, and then basically we multiply everything out. So in the middle, we get this, uh, this inner product. Ah, didn't we know that inner product? Yeah, we knew that inner product, right? So that's what it is, that is this here. The inner product is just the sum of the two. That was this thing with the angle. Sorry, now I've got it. So, um, so we can rewrite this as basically the sum of these two. And now we look at it. Our parabola has this form. This is the height that I didn't know, but I don't need to know because I want to find a zero of a parabola. And now you see that from another perspective. This other perspective is basically, this is the only term I don't know. I know this term. I know that term and I know that term. And if I now take the derivative of the parabola, well, what happens? This thing goes away. Um, this thing goes away. And this thing goes away and somewhere I get it two. That's it. And you find the zero of the parabola and you have the step size. Um, that is the Gerhard Cauchy acceleration. And the second statement just follows from you just basically you take what you know now, you, you know now that this is the optimal step size, you plug it into G and that's what you get out. And um, then you just remember what G is. G is this thing here. G is that error. And then basically that's what you get. Okay, so now we have re-understood what Gerhard Cauchy is doing. So can we use that understanding to go further. And first, maybe we can assess like what we know about Gerhard Cauchy, <clears throat> theoretically. Um, we know that, um, mm, well, what do we know? We know that basically we have <clears throat> a sequence that's coming from the Kachmash, cyclic projections, that is already pretty good. So this converges to zero and it converges to zero linearly. So we know we have a certain factor by which this shrinks in every um, iteration. And uh, so if I do better than that, so if my sequence does better than that, that's not a problem because then I'm, I have that error instead of that error. And then I'm going to multiply with a certain constant and get an upper bound on the decay. So far, so good. So it looks like I could only do well with this, right? But um, yeah, well, let's first look at the, at the good points. Basically, the old paper by, by Bregman um, tells us that any sequence that has this kind of behavior um, will con converge to a solution um, in finite dimensions. Um, and uh, then um, the... Um, well, from what I just said here, it's always going to be at least better. And then I can apply the old reasoning from Deutsch and so on again. Um, and that tells me that I'm not going to be worse than Deutsch predicts. Basically the Deutsch error bound will always hold because I can only improve it that way. Um, and what's also good is that this Gerhard Cauchy step size performs very well in practice as we would see. Um, then it's already getting a bit bad. So we don't know any explicit error estimates. And the only thing that as far as I know, and this is probably even new, is this here. But this is also not very helpful because this is a posteriori. Um, so I only know how much by how much I improved, and even that only in this square norm sense uh, after I did it. So I cannot say, um, I don't even know what the error is. I know. I reduced the square error by this, but I don't know what it is. So, <clears throat> so it's a bit uh, tricky to use this, this uh, error estimate. And um, <clears throat> then it gets really ugly because actually, even though Gerhard Cauchy, I call it acceleration, 
it can actually underperform the Kutchmarsh method. And this is uh, basically given in a <clears throat> an example by these three people here. Uh, I don't know whether um, Heinz is here. I haven't seen him, but I cannot look now. So, um, so um, they, if I remember correctly, the idea is simply you take one sequence where um, where Kutchmarsh really converges to the solution in two steps or three steps. I don't remember. And then you take a solution that is somewhere else and doesn't do that. So you, of course you, uh, no, no, sorry. You, the accelerated version does not converge in finite time, but the uh, plain Kutchmarsh converges in finite time. And of course you can't beat that. Um, so <clears throat> it can get ugly, but you have to have really specific examples to make that happen. As I said, in practice, it is usually very good. So. For, for me now, the question was like, what is the best we can hope for? We know that even the plain um, Gerhard Cauchy can be worse than the Kutchmarsh method. So if I refine that, I'm not going to change that. What I can do is I can try to make this thing here as good as possible. I can um, try to make this error as small as I possibly can um, and hope for the best. And as I said, I mean, if you make that very small, you improve the Deutsch estimates, you improve them, but you have no guarantee that you know, you're really better than Kachmash will really do. I mean, Kachmash, I haven't brought the pictures, but these estimates that you have for these methods are really far off reality. So um, basically, theoretically, it's, it's good. Practically, you don't know. The, um, the experiment must decide. Okay, so how can I how can I improve on this? Well, what would be the simplest idea? The simplest idea would be I have here my x. I have my p of x that takes me here to this point, which is p of x. Um, well, let's put a point there. Then my step size the uh, Gerhard Cauchy step size decides, no, actually, you shouldn't go there. That's not a good idea. It's much better to go here. And maybe I should have called this here x1. And maybe I should have called this p of x1. And then I can call this here x2. So I'm going to x2 with this step size. And then I'm playing the same game again. I'm uh, doing my step. I'm doing my step. And so this is P of X2. And um, so here we are. And then what do I do now? Do I now use uh, Gerhard Cauchy again or do I do something that is a bit more general? Well, why don't I use basically, why don't I make this here my new center? What color can I use here? So this, why don't I make this point my new center? And you see, you have one vector going here and you have another vector going that way. Why don't I look for the best approximation for X star in that two dimensional space? Is that possible? Can we repeat this kind of miracle that Gerhard Cauchy is doing, finding the solution of a least squares problem? I mean, I can't really draw it because I only have two dimensions here. Um, but can I imagine that is somehow this, this point is at your nose or something, right? I mean, that um, it's not in that plane. Uh, can I find basically the, uh, this is the projection of X star, right? This is the projection of X star which is your nose to the screen, right? So you're trying to find your nose and you can only find that point on the screen, which is the best approximation. And uh, so can I do that? Because I need to solve again, a least squares problem where I don't know the data. The data is actually the thing that I'm trying to find. Um, does it work again? And so what I'm doing here is I'm basically formalizing what I've drawn. So here you see, um, we only have one vector here because I can't draw so many. This is basically that blue vector here that so all the, basically the space spent by the previous iterates 
these vectors that then space that span. So there's a fine basis goes into V. And then the M holds one more vector, which is then my new step. That is this one, right? So I have the past in V and I have the future added to the past in M. And now the question, can I use this information and can I somehow repeat this miracle with more vectors? And at first I thought, this is crazy. This will never work and it does work. So let's see why it works. <clears throat> the theorem is as follows. Here you see um, a solution and uh, these here are previous iterates. They are uh, finally independent because otherwise we would have terminated if they are finally dependent. We have found the solution already. We'll not go into details. Um, so, and then um, the last iterate by construction, that's how we always do it, was the best um, approximation to the desired solution in the affine space spent by the previous iterates. That's basically the idea. That's how we want to improve the algorithm, how we want to generalize the algorithm. And uh, we also want that the new um, step, Kashmir step is not in the affine hull because again, we would have that XL is the um, exact solution for reasons that are difficult to explain now and very, very easy to read up. I mean, it's, it's almost trivial. Um, then now we have to solve this least squares problem with the unknown solution as data. So we are trying to find that solution, putting in a solution that we don't know. <clears throat> and the, the, the um, result is very surprising. It's not surprising that you find the normal equations here. What is surprising is that actually you can convert this uh, least squares problem um, into an equation, a linear equation, where every single uh, piece of data is known. Here, this is basically past and future pressed into one matrix. This thing times itself. And here, what do you have? You have zero, 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 gamma. And gamma is our old friend here, you see? Gamma is this term. And this here is only like a performance of this thing, but with the same problems, we, we can evaluate it even at runtime because we know these numbers. So we know how well we performed, but same problems as for Gerhard Cauchy. Okay, so, um, so, and now let's see why this is true. And actually the gist of this can again be proved on one page. So we have a quadratic function, looks familiar, right? Just now we have um, a few more vectors in here and this S is not a, a scalar anymore, it's a vector, but we want to minimize that. So what do we do when we want to minimize? Well, we take the derivative and set it to zero, right? So we want, zero is this up to zero is that. So we have many of these here because these are the first so and so many. <clears throat> you, you remember, so in, in M we have the past and the future. Here's the past, basically these, these correspond here to the past and this here is the future. This is the new one, right? So I'm basically I'm taking all the derivatives and so the first L minus one derivatives, they basically they act on these vectors here, which are these past vectors. And only the very last S here acts on the last column of, uh, of M, which is the future vector. Okay, so, and now we know that, that this is zero. And so maybe we just reorganize a bit <clears throat> and we push everything that seems to belong together, like for example, we push this and that times that to the other side and keep, keep that times that on that side. And uh, then we, for the, at first we forget about these here. Then we get these two these two equations, right? So this here, first equation becomes that equation. It's just rearranging. The second equation becomes that equation, just rearranging. That's that's all. And um, so now we have these two here. And now we have to think like what we actually see here. And now 
Well, what do we know about these? These are zero, why? Because this was, this XL was the best approximation in the space spanned by the XJ. So that means that this must be orthogonal because this is the best approximation in the space where all these things live uh, in the affine space. So this is orthogonal, best approximation, zero, right? And here, what do we find? We find that um, a, the new step times M times S is this here. And what was that? That was our equation number two again here, right? Where here is it? So that is this product. And this product is this, and we call this here basically gamma or gamma over two, um, I don't remember. So here we have gamma. So you see, and what did we do all in all? This is the first to the L minus one kind of row of M transpose. And this here is the last row of M transpose. So all in all, this here is really M transpose M S is zero in the first components and gamma in the last. So here, that is that, that is exactly that. This system times S is this. How did this magic happen? This magic happened because we knew this about XL. So this is absolutely crucial. I don't know how else to, to do that. So we, we know this about the XL. This is basically this property, this orthogonality property. And we knew this about this angle. It's basically a, a, a property of this residual R. So really by understanding properly what this residual does and is, um, we can generalize this method. And now how do we use this? Well, of course, at first we have a point, then we make a step, then we use Gerhard Cauchy as it is and we get a new point. Now, this new point is of course the best, the best point in this line. So we have the best point in this line. That's basically what we require in order to apply this theorem. So we, from this point, we do another Kachmar step. And now we are in this situation. We put past and future into that matrix M and we know what we need to solve in order to get the best point in that entire plane. And then we go on and on and on. And now this would already be pretty nice, I think, but there's much more actually. We can make this really nice because who wants to solve this, li this linear system? I don't for two reasons, because it get la gets larger and larger. Maybe we don't want that. And the second reason is that actually this is pretty ill-conditioned if you're unlucky. Yeah? So the normal equations, you get that taught in linear algebra all over the place by people who do theory. And then in, uh, in, in practice, people, people don't know that you must never do that. Yeah? Never solve this system because it's usually or very often ill-conditioned. So um, we would like to avoid this. How is that possible? Well, now I'm going fast and maybe I lose a few people, but it's, it's very short and we will have pictures at the end. So um, what happens? I have a matrix V. Yeah, so some V at some point in time. And now I could ask myself, like I have several vectors and now I add a new one. And now I want to see, I want to reparameterize everything so that I again look from the point of view of the vector L here. So, um, and I added a new one. So I want to look from the point of view of the new vector because then I will, to that new vector attach a Kachmar step and so on, like what I explained before. So uh, what is the new vector? The new vector was, well, the old vector plus the step, right? So M S star, the optimal step, if you can say so, the optimal fine combination. So, um, and what is this now? So I basically, I'm asking, do you see this is the new matrix V after doing this step and this reparameterization look out, uh, so shift to the perspective of that vector. So, and then if you just use elementary computations and you have this thing here and you basically only use 
actually this year is theoretically very useful to have this because then you always know something, you know, so for example, you know, M transposed times this is, well, M, yeah, it's, you see, so this is very helpful. You can basically always use this identity. So what comes out when you do these computations is that here where I had the old V transposed V, so here I had the old V transposed V, I get my old V transposed V, but I have to add, uh, what do I put in here? I put, um, I don't know, T, right? So here I call this thing T because it's very cumbersome to put this in. So, and what do I find on the stuff that I added? Because now I have more past, right? So the past was, compute, was in, in V transpose V. Now I have gone one further, I have more past. What do I find here? Right? If I, what do I find in my V transposed V here? I know what I find in my V, the usual vectors I've discussed, but in V transpose V, I find the same T and here I find the same T and here I find the same T, surprise. Very strange, right? So what happens? So what happens really if I do that all along? So I basically, I, I just start with one vector, then I don't have any V because I don't have any past. So I've done my first uh, Gerhard Cauchy step, and then I have a little bit of past. So this is my old V. So I add, basically, I make this larger, add a few zeros there and add T on top of everything. Then this here is one number and the number here is different, but it's the same for all these three numbers, right? Because I have T, T, T. And then I do my next step and what do I get? I add something here, I add something here, I add the same thing here. So basically I get something that looks like this. And so it looks like this and I go on and on and on. So I get a very, very strange matrix, right? And this very, very straight, strange matrix, I basically I want to invert this matrix or a version of this matrix. So if this matrix is such a strange matrix and I understand how it builds up, maybe I can say something about this matrix. Actually, I, I know this matrix in and out because I know these numbers, right? So I computed them in order to make my step. Again, use them, right? So um, I know these, and so I know exactly what I have here. And let's go, go to the next slide, if it lets me. So my matrix looks like this. You see, here's a number, here's a different number, and here's yet another number made up of these alpha i's that actually are these coefficients that I know. This is my basically my V transposed V, this here. And now it gets better. The V transposed V has an inverse, I found, that you can write down explicitly. And even better, you can write it down explicitly in terms of these numbers, which we know because they are the numbers we have just computed, right? It is very strange. And um, so then it gets even better because if you now think of the M transposed M um, as the G here, so here's the V transpose V basically, here is the future vector or the action of the future vector and here's, you, know, you see, so somehow I don't have enough time to go through all details, but, um, you see, um, basically this is what builds up and then you can explicitly invert this matrix um, acting on this thing. You see, this is this M transpose M times um, times S is this uh, gamma EN. Um, oops. Um, and uh, I, can ex I can explicitly invert that without ever inverting a matrix. I apply a tri-diagonal matrix diagonal matrix that you have just seen to the future vector. Um, then I need the same thing here again. So I have an inner product here and that's it, right? So it is extremely cheap basically to solve these systems and it's extremely cheap to update them. I never even write the matrix B down because the inverse is uh, encoded in these coefficients which I can just store and keep. Um, and so, because we, uh, I promised pictures and it's close to the end. So if you apply this to a tomography um, problem with 10 times 10 picture, uh, pixels, 20 times 20 pixels, uh, 40 times 40 pixels, 
um, because I don't have exactly a supercomputer. I uh, stopped at that stage because I had to make many experiments to convince myself that this is actually right, what, I, what we see there. So what is the blue line? The blue line is the catch marsh without any external help. And you can't really see that, but you see how, you can imagine how fast this decays here and then it basically flattens out. <clears throat> so what happens in practice sometimes is that people use that here and when they find it flattens out, then they switch to something else or um, whatever. Um, so, but my concern was now, how do I make sure that this flattening out doesn't happen? And um, so, or how can I counteract that as much as possible? So here, the red line, this is the Gerhard Cauchy step size. And um, so without my um, generalization, and then you find, well, this year, so this is a one dimensional search space. Here you have a two dimensional search space, four dimensional and infinity means I just keep all the iterates Infinity is basically the method I've shown you. There are a few other methods as well that you can, um, but it, it doesn't matter. So you have seen the black line and for obvious reasons, it seems to be usually the best thing to do. Um, and then you see that uh, basically, well, things get worse. You see everything gets very flat and um, you see that the efficiency of the uh, Gerhard Cauchy step size uh, kind of diminishes. And it's even more um, pronounced when we go here now to the random catch marsh, where I've basically just applied the same technology to the random catch marsh measure method. This is something that I just want to say as a side note, you can apply that there. And um, you can basically apply that to any projection type method, which is bizarre. I mean, you can also these gauer richtarik methods, it, it's applicable there. As long as you can write a method as performing projections, um, you can apply this technology. And uh, yeah, you see basically the same picture and you see here it's even more pronounced here. The, um, um, the Gerhard Cauchy step size is giving you an advantage, but it's not as pronounced. I mean, you have to read this horizontally, so it's not as bad as it looks, but it's not as good as you want it to be. And you can be really a lot faster than that. Okay, so I close with questions. And there are algorithmic questions. The first one is, is that something well known in disguise? Because there are connections, obvious connections with CG and Krudov space methods. But I've looked at it and I didn't see it. And uh, of course the ideas, are similar ideas are, are everywhere. Um, and uh, the next question is, well, I don't solve the normal equations numerically, but I'm still using them. Can that be avoided um, because of the ill postness? I mean, I'm not solving them. That means, I mean, I improve and it's not as unstable as it would be if I would really solve that numerically, but it still can amplify errors and we don't want that. Um, is there a way of, of doing that? I'm, I'm not sure. You could think of rank one updates of uh, QR decompositions, but then I didn't see how to do that in such a way that, because we don't have the data, right? We don't have the X star. Um, and uh, so I don't see how to do that. Um, and then there are um, theoretical questions, because if we do these norm estimates that you see all over the literature, I don't think that we will ever analyze this uh, Gerhard Cauchy acceleration properly, because this is simply too blunt. It is just tell, looking in what ball are you in. But that is totally, so that means in every step we throw away all information about the geometry we know. And then basically we start from scratch, taking the geometry into account. Then we do a norm estimate and throw it all away. This is too blunt. This will never give us, uh, give us a good understanding. And uh, then um, is it uh, easier to maybe get some such estimate in the uh, random context, because the random con context you, is a bit more complicated because you get randomness, but it's a lot easier because you don't have the this uh, thing with the order. The order doesn't matter anymore because in expectation, every step is the same. So that may help uh, uh, doing these estimates. Okay, then I'm at the end of the talk. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that there was a um, that there was a 
uh, chat message because that was behind behind the panel which I used to draw. Sorry. Okay. Um, then I'm at the end. Um, thanks for attention. Thank you. Thank you, Janusz. Uh, very interesting presentation and. Uh, the pictures uh, were an important part, of course, of the presentation. And I'm really impressed by the way you draw and write on, directly on the slides. Uh, it, it is also a kind of magic for me. No, that is very, has a very simple explanation. I couldn't speak for one year. Then you have to learn how to draw and write very fast, right? <laughs> okay, so there are positive things behind all negative things. Of course. Well, great. Do we have uh, professional questions, please? Any comments, discussion? Link? Yes, um, uh, Janos, um, I have, uh, can, can you remind me if, if you have any uh, conversion rate? For, for what do you mean? Better? Conversion rate, um, the rate, rate of conversion. Rate of convergence. Can no, you say, no, no. say anything? No? no? That's what I mean. There is no way to say anything about it. That's basically what I what I want to say. I mean, we uh, there is no um, so in the in the original paper what they have there, it's it's basically just they they say maybe I better go back up there. What they say is that, where is it? Yes, so they basically write, uh, I hope I can get this right now. So they block this out and then they say that this is this uh, minus a number fi, which is not specified. So they have convergence estimate, but the estimates contain numbers that have no specification, mm -hmm. which is a bit strange. Um, and um, so I thought maybe we can do something about it. And that was my attempt here to actually use this different perspective to actually get at least something of this type. So we can at least understand yeah. how much we got down and how much is that better than the Kachmash step would have been. Um, so we can at least understand a little bit, uh, but it's totally insufficient. I agree, um, and that's basically the reason for my for my question here. And the question is like, can we can we analyze that? Can we analyze that properly? So what I have done now, what I can tell you is, um, this method is a lot better than the Gerhard. Cauchy acceleration. And where can I show you that? Um, so the gain here by Gerhard Cauchy is this one, but it's very hard to compare now. Uh, this here is the gain of when I, when I have an L-dimensional affine space, then this is the gain. And if you, how can I, how can I um, explain that well? Um, basically, what you can say is if you have two steps of the Kachmash method, cyclic projections that are going in a similar direction. Um, and because here you see this here, this, these are basically the volumes of these, I don't know how to say that in English, parallel somethings, right? These determinants of matrices are somehow, they are, uh, they're telling you something about the volume that the vectors in the matrices span. And here you see this here is very flat. And when this is very flat, then this, uh, then, then the, uh, then Gerhard Cauchy will not perform very well. And the two dimensional method will perform a lot better because it can look that way, you see? Like Gerhard Cauchy is very one dimensional, right? It can only look one way. And if, it, if uh, the Kachmash method does many steps in a similar direction, then it doesn't get that. And so the, the more it goes ahead, so the, the, the more um, you can gain by having more, um, more dimensions in your approach. And this here is the formal way of, of saying like how good this is. And uh, in the paper, I have, I have discussed it uh, one, 
one direction versus two in depth. Uh, but uh, I, I can't write that out, out of the top of my head. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's uh, um, obtaining the, the identity as you have here, maybe even harder than, than obtaining some, some estimates, right? some inequality. <laughs> Yeah, I learned this from Matthew. Matthew does that all the time. Yeah. So uh, he and he does, he does that very well. So um, basically, a few of the tricks I used here in in, in the proofs uh, I basically learned from him. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can I um, uh, ask a, a simple question here? Maybe uh, I'm I'm thinking since the uh, dimensions the search of, of the search directions are so important, would it be easy to to add a sort of pre conditioning step where you rearrange your matrix since you are not using the stochastic approach you go you use the the cyclic projections in order but maybe you could find a more meaningful order where you um, make sure you increase the, the dimensions in which you can search faster than than you otherwise would because there's so many and and, and uh, you have uh, because of the size of the matrix you um, or the shape of the matrix I think um, uh, yeah, the, yeah, I have yeah so, so, so you only you only really you, you probably don't even need all uh, um, rows of the matrix really to spend the full search space right yeah that's Maybe. different that is different um, so you are thinking of a CG uh, of a DM REST type method where you really uh, like work with one row at a time. And then, um, so this is not what this is doing. Um, this is basically taking a full Kachma cycle. Yeah. And, um, and so the, the XL that you see here, these are not after applying one row, this is applying after applying a full cycle. Mm. What, yeah, yeah, okay, but okay. You, you have a point that I mean the order matters a lot when um, when it's not randomized, and this is also something that I'm asking myself: like, uh, can we find a better order? And is there? Do, do you know anything? Is there? Is there? Um, is there any result in that direction? How to order things well? No, I don't. Uh, but I'm I'm thinking maybe you could have some earlier on in the algorithm. You could have some preliminary steps where you where you apply your method to only um, a sub problem of the of the full problem. Yeah, you that you right can order. do that. You can or you can also you can cluster certain uh, you can cluster certain certain rows and then do uh, simultaneous projections. Uh, that's no problem as long as you. So this method basically works as long as you do projections and the reason is simple because what you really want is this Pythagoras here and this Pythagoras works whenever you have a projection it doesn't matter that this is one dimensional or so co-dimensional one doesn't matter nothing matters as long as you as you do projections onto subspaces that do contain the thing that you're looking for you're, you're good so there, there is a lot of things that, that you could do, but uh, I can't even put error estimates on this. So, um, so that's that would be my priority. Very okay. interesting talk, anyway, so thank you. Thanks. For the great yeah. picture. Yeah, really enjoyed that. Interesting talk indeed. I don't think we have much. We we have time for for questions unless someone. Uh, Yes, a really pressing one, which can't be postponed. Do you have such fundamental questions? If not, thank you again, Janos, for your Thanks nice everybody. presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for joining us for this seminar. We continue in a week. And uh, keep in mind that next week, the talk is by a person from Canada, and that's why it is at 11 o'clock Australian time. Okay, thank you very much.